Good morning. My name is Devin Alley, and I've been a member of Tennessee Valley Unitarian Universalist Church since 2009. I'm sharing a testimonial today as we lead up to the stewardship campaign kickoff on February 21st. I always joke that if you were to go back in time to tell high school Devin that I would grow up to be a Sunday school teacher, there would be absolutely no way I would have believed you. <laughs> I grew up neo-pagan and completely outside of any organized religion. But ever since finding a spiritual home at TVUUC, I've been very involved in the religious education, exploration programs, a space that has been a nurturing and positive force for all of my children. During the pandemic, TVUUC has been a cornerstone for my family. We have been extra precautious and extremely isolated ever since March 13th, 2020. Not that I'm counting down the days or anything. We have been working from home. We've been homeschooling our kids and we spend time with only one other household. My in-laws who live right next door. It has been a very rough year for all of us. And I'm not sure how I could have done it without this amazing church. Through RE spaces on Zoom, we connect live and face to face with other families every Sunday. Because of initiatives like the pick me up packs and camp in the box, we connect physically with the church um, every single week through fun activities that we can relate to monthly themes and to our faith. The Wednesday night parenting circle has been a vital pillar of personal and emotional support for me. And I'm not ashamed to completely admit that probably half of my homeschool curriculum is supplemented by the Children's Diversity and Justice Library and the fact that they have a curbside pickup program. Thank you. It has been devastating that we can't physically meet in person right now. But the last 10 months have shown me just how strong and supportive this church can be. I am grateful for this community and I am grateful for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for letting me share with you today. Thank you for all you do for our community and thank you in advance for your generosity during this year's campaign. Christians, Buddhists, and Jews got their own version of the truth. And there's a line in the sand, there's a war going on. They forgot to remember you might be wrong. Carry your faith everywhere you go. Mix it with love and let it show. But keep your mind open as you move along. And always remember you might be wrong.
Open up the doors. Push on looming wooden arches embroidered with ironwork. Brace shoulders against the weight of history unmoved. Slough off the musty smell of unused joy and stored up sorrow. Knock rust off the hinges if you have to and let your breath precede you inside. Open the doors more, make room for a shaft of sunlight to cross the threshold. Give the dust motes something to dance about. Peek through a single slice of possibility and name even the half-hidden truths you see. Open the doors wider still, pour yourself through the gap, strut or sneak or sidle as suits you best. Cleanse whatever scrapes catch your skin and bind up the wounds that keep you from entering whole. Open the doors as far as they will go. Draw on the strength of the stones beneath you. Ground yourself in a firm sense of who you are and stand as a beacon welcoming the next seeker and shine far beyond the lintel and sill. Open all that you are, heighten and deepen your connection to the world around you. Broaden your definition of neighbor. Grow into the largest target for grace that you can muster and pray to become a gateway for even greater love and compassion. Open up the doors, my friends, lest we keep the stranger out and condemn ourselves to prisons of our own making. Come, let us worship together. Rise up, O flame, by thy light glowing, show to us beauty, show to us beauty. Rise up, O flame, by thy light glowing, show to us beauty, show to us Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. To dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. This is our great covenant.
So I noticed something recently. If you have been driving down Kingston Pike near the church lately, you might have noticed something new popping up in front of many of the congregations in the area, and it's a sign that looks like this. Now this is the second year of the Love Your Neighbor project, and it was started by the First United Methodist Church as, in their words, a powerful witness to Knoxville that our diverse faith communities always have more in common than we have that divides us. But what does love your neighbor really mean? In the Christian tradition, it is said that Jesus told a story to explain what loving your neighbor as yourself uh, means. And here's a version of the story uh, from our very own Reverend Chris Bice that goes like this. One day, a merchant was traveling on a road when he was attacked by bandits. The bandits were so cruel that they beat the merchant, stole everything he had, and left him for dead lying on the side of the road. The merchant was so badly hurt He couldn't move or speak at all, and he could barely see through his swollen black eyes. What a terrible thing to happen to him. And a long time passed. And then, down the road came a priest, a man of God. That priest looked good. He was wearing fancy, fancy new robe, and he was nice and clean from a recent bath. And when the merchant saw the priest coming, he became excited. Surely this priest will help me, he thought. But when the priest saw the man lying on the side of the road, he just kept on walking and passed him right by. After a time, the injured merchant saw another person coming down the road, and this person was a temple helper And this person looked good. This person was well-groomed, had a nice new haircut, wore beautiful, colorful robes, and had a winning smile. And once again, the merchant became hopeful. Surely this time, this person will help me, he thought. But when the temple helper saw the merchant lying on the side of the road, that person too just kept on walking and passed him right by. A very long time passed and the merchant began to lose hope. He thought, I will die here on the side of the road. He was too injured to help himself, but then he saw someone else walking down the road with a donkey. This man did not look too good. He was dirty and his clothes had holes in them. He didn't look like he had shaved or cut his hair in a long, long time. And what do you think the merchant thought? The merchant thought, this man will not help me. I can see that he is from Samaria and Samaritans hate my people. But. When the man saw the merchant lying on the side of the road, he stopped. He was moved with compassion. The Samaritan washed and bandaged the merchant's wounds. And he put the merchant onto the back of his own donkey, carried him to an inn, and took care of him. And the next day, as the Samaritan prepared to leave, he gave the innkeeper money and said, Please take care of this man. When I return, I will pay you any more money that you may spend to care for him. From his window in the inn, the merchant could see the Samaritan walking off into the distance. And the merchant was too weak to call out or even speak his thanks aloud at all. But ever since that time, the merchant has known deep in his heart that there is a big difference between looking good and being good. So in the traditional parable that is said to have been told by the teacher Jesus, he says, so who was the neighbor? 
this person who was thought to be so different, who thought would hate him, who, who thought their people don't like our people at all, who are our neighbors, friends. And so as we celebrate Valentine's Day this weekend, I encourage you, if you like, to take a little drive around. Sometimes it's nice to get out of the house if we can, even in this time when we are staying mostly at home when we can. And take a look at all the love your neighbor signs that are around as a reminder that, as they say, uh, as the leaders of this project say, that there is so much more that unites us that we have in common than there is different between our traditions and between all of the people in our Knoxville community. May we love one another well. Choose to Bless the World by the Reverend Dr. Rebecca Ann Parker. Reverend Parker is a theologian who served as president of the Unitarian Universalist Star King for the ministry in Berkeley, California from 1994 to 2014. Your gifts, whatever you discover them to be, can be used to bless or curse the world. The mind's power, the strength of the hands, the reaches of the heart, the gift of speaking, listening, imagining, seeing, waiting. Any of these can serve to feed the hungry, bind up wounds, welcome the stranger, praise what is sacred, do the work of justice, or offer love. Any of these can draw down the prison door, hoard bread, abandon the poor, obscure what is holy, comply with injustice, or withhold love. You must answer this question. What will you do with your gifts? Choose to bless the world? The choice to bless the world is more than an act of will or moving forward into the world with the intention to do good. It is an act of recognition, a confession of surprise, a grateful acknowledgement that in the midst of a broken world, unspeakable beauty, grace, and mystery abide. There is an embrace of kindness, the encompass of all life, even yours. And what there is, and while there is injustice and anesthetization or evil, there moves a holy disturbance. A benevolent rage. A revolutionary love. Protesting, urging, that which is sacred will not be defied. Those who bless the world live their life as a gesture of thanks for this beauty and this rage. The choice to bless the world can take you into solitude to search for the sources of power and grace, native wisdom, healing, and liberation. More, the choice will draw you into community. The endeavor shared, the heritage passed on. 
the companionship of struggle, the importance of keeping faith, the life of ritual and praise, the comfort of human friendship, the company of earth, the chorus of life welcoming. None of us alone can save the world. Together, Together that is another possibility waiting. Oh, what a beautiful week of days. I hope you've enjoyed some of the warmth and sunshine this week. Good morning, friends. I am Carolyn, serving you today as part of the spiritual care team here at TVUUC. Be sure to check um, for our contact number in the newsletter or on the Facebook page. We are here for you. This is the time in our service where we share joys and concerns. So join me now in imagining us surrounded by our friends. You may have met them recently in little Zoom boxes or on a carefully masked and distanced walk. But I encourage you to recall them as whole human beings whom you will meet again in the future. Today I was thinking how we might feel apart from everyone. And yet we are each such a part of a warm and caring whole. Check out the adult RE meditation in your newsletter and you can consider what it means to you to be a part of this beloved community. As part of surrounding each other with our caring, here are some people and places where you can send comfort and support. The Logan Temple AME Zion Church. It was a target for racist vandalism. A yet unknown assailant threw a bottle with a racial slur on it through the church window. This year marks the 156th anniversary of that congregation. And so Pastor Sam Brown says, it will take more than this to stop us. Help ensure that love will overcome hate by sending them a message of support. You can get addresses for these in your newsletter. We're happy to announce that Debbie Ellis' partner, Kenny, is now home from the hospital and recovering from pneumonia. Debbie always finds solace in what she calls the healing power of poker. So I asked Reverend Jametta if she had any words she wanted to share with us today. And I smile as I read her upbeat response. She says, I don't have any words to share except the road is long, yet it continues to have joyous moments. And so we continue to lift her up in our prayers. Now here's a good story that Jenna Mashburn encouraged me to share with you. It may not be very welcome news, but it was a good story. So we were planning to take some, uh, some pre-knee pre surgery flowers and wine to her the other afternoon until Jenna sent me a text saying, SOS, unbelievably I tested positive for COVID. Now, it may be that Bob's recent rash was a COVID symptom, but neither of them have had fever or other discomfort. Anyway, needless to say, knee surgery has been postponed until the end of the month when we expect to bring you a cheerful update. As Jenna would say, send them some good woo-woo. <laughs> now, John Coffey is relieved to report that his mother is recovering from some heart issues resulting from a COVID infection she had back in December. Her situation reminds us 
of the importance of wearing a mask to protect others and to pay attention to possible after effects when you're healing. May he and his family feel our love. And let us continue to hold Gary Hendricks and family in the light. Gary is the husband of Ellen and the father of Chelsea. He has moved out of ICU into long-term acute care. I recall what Ellen shared last week. She said, the more love and prayers, the better. Yes, the more love and prayers, the better. Laura Broussard and her husband, Sean, are happy to announce the birth of their son, Lucas Will Wilson Broussard, at Fort Sanders Hospital last week, weighing in at a healthy eight pounds, one ounce, 19 and three quarters inches. We welcome you, baby Lewis. And congratulations to Christopher Watkins Lamb and Amber Lamb on the birth of their daughter, whose name is Trin Trina Bray. I almost, I, I knew I had to practice that. Baby Trina Bray Lamb moves Renowin Lamb into the role of big sister. A happy day for the whole family. TVUUC member Alandria Williams of blessed member memory will be honored at the Ethel Beck celebration as part of Black History Month at the Beck Cultural Exchange Center. Her accomplishments included community organizing for justice on the local, the national, and the international level, as well as serving as co-moderator of the UUA, which is the highest volunteer position in our denomination. Her, pap her papers and other documents will be placed in the archives at the Beck Cultural Center. So you can consult your newsletter to find addresses where you can send cards of comfort and joy to all of these mentioned. We know there are so many, so many other joys and concerns that are unspoken or held in confidence. We have friends who are suffering side effects and recovering from COVID. We have others who are anxiously awaiting test results friends of friends with devastating diagnosis, dear ones dealing with financial woes, sad losses of independence, isolation. Yes, it is not an easy time. Yet we do have each other. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. We said together to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. That is our great covenant. Tell somebody you love them today. Celebrate with friends who have new babies and grandchildren and friends who have sweethearts on this day. Join a Zoom group for sharing laughter and other good feelings. When I feel stuck in a rut, I go outside and I look up at the big open sky and for the moment, I can believe I can fly. Maybe I'll see you there. For now, join me right here while we bask in the blessing of these words from Wendell Berry, followed by a moment of silence. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives will be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free.
May you know peace and joy on this day. Amen. No, no, no. Praise, praise how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was the grave. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today at TVUUC. My name is Claudia Presley and I'm the Director of Administration here. Today is a Share the Plate Sunday. What that means is that any contribution that comes in today will be split between the General Operating Fund of TVUUC and a local organization. Today's organization is the Beck Cultural Center. You'll be seeing a short video here in a few minutes about what the Beck Center does and how that you can help them. The ways that you can give are to go to tvuuc.org slash give or you can text give to the number 73256 type in TVUUC and the amount that you would like to give. So today, please think about what you can do to help this organization and to help TVUUC. Once again, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful day. Welcome back across the nation. Communities are celebrating Black History Month and recognizing the achievements and contributions of African Americans. In Knoxville, there is no shortage of history makers, doers, and achievers. This morning, we take a look at the efforts to preserve and record the African American experience in Knoxville. There were old African American newspapers. So you could come in here and you could begin to go through and really get a taste of what life was like. History at your fingertips. The Beck Cultural Exchange Center gives East Tennesseans a glimpse of Knoxville's history with old books, black and white photos, relics from Knoxville of decades past. History is hard sometimes, especially some of the history of African Americans and those uh, folks that were disenfranchised. So it's difficult sometimes to revisit those moments. But what we like to do here at Beck is to help us digest those moments in history in a way that we learn and grow from them. Started in 1975, the Beck bears the name of the late James and Ethel Beck, a prominent and influential Knoxville couple from the 20s through 60s. Photos show them engaging with history giants like W.E.B. Du Bois and Martin Luther King Jr. Reverend Renee Kessler serves as president of the museum and community center. She says it tells the story of blacks in Knoxville who changed the landscape of the city. People you sometimes won't find with an internet service. You may never even know that this existed right here in your own community, but they did. And indeed, their stories are important. And you get an opportunity to not only know and hear their stories and see their stories in the pictures, but you also get to experience that and then learn and grow from that. And here's an area many will never see at the back, and that's the archive studio. Hundreds of boxes that preserve the history of the African-American experience here in Knoxville. Take a look at this. This is a Knoxville College yearbook back in 1925, showing all those old photos of what life was like back then. You may have heard of the name Cal Johnson. He was a former slave turned millionaire businessman who built the first racetrack in Knoxville, now known as Speedway Circle. And what's really interesting is the very first plane that ever landed in Knoxville and or ever took off in Knoxville did so on his track. And you know whose plane that was? The Wright brothers came in 1911. 
and there is no shortage of history makers coming out of Knoxville. The thing that's so great though, um, Tyson, and that we love to talk about is he is a native Knoxvillean. He is from Knoxville. And so uh, there's a house that actually still stands in South Knoxville. A law room dedicated to Judge William Hasty, whom President Franklin Roosevelt appointed the nation's first African-American federal magistrate. So many remarkable stories to be told of perseverance and strength of community sitting under one roof. I believe by faith that Knoxville can be a model to our greater community, our greater nation, about what it really means to embrace one another, to care for one another, and to genuinely seek to know each other better. And that's what we do here. And they do it one visitor at a time. I can't stress enough how everybody needs to go and visit. It right. really just kind of completes the stories that you hear about Knoxville from decades past. Right. And fill some holes because what I love about there, it's everybody's story. It's not just all black history. Mm -hmm. It's the inner intertwining of what um, Knoxville's um, white citizens did sure. to help and kind of just move things forward. And they also have oral history. Right. From 1919, the folks who were here for the 1990 race riot, they have folks that give the account from that time, and you can go in and listen for free. Mm -hmm. All of it is free, and even going in to just go and use the um, facility itself. I thought it was interesting, Reverend Kessler saying, history is hard, it's tough to revisit sometimes, mm -hmm. but they take it and they hope that we build and learn from it, and that's the whole purpose there. It's I thought a it was very interesting. fantastic yeah. experience. All right, so again, it is free. Go online to our website. We have everything you need to know to go and visit the Beck and get more information. When I was a boy each week, on Sunday we would go to church and pay attention to the priest. He would read the Holy Word And consecrate the Holy Bread And everyone would kneel and bow Today the only difference is Everything's holy now Everything, everything, everything is holy When I was in Sunday school, we would learn about the time Moses split the sea in two, Jesus made the water one. I remember feeling sad that miracles don't happen still, but now I can't keep track, cause everything's a miracle. Everything, everything, everything's a miracle. Wine from water is not so small, but an even better magic trick is that anything is here at all. So Challenging thing becomes not to look for miracles, but finding where there isn't one. When holy water was rare at best, it barely wet my fingertips. But now I have to hold my breath like I'm swimming in a sea of air. Used to be a world half there, heaven second rate hand me down. I walk it with a reverent air, cause everything is holy now. Everything, everything, everything is holy now. Read a questioning child. Say it's not a testament That'd be very hard to say See Another new morning come Say it's not a sacrament I tell you that it can't be done This 
Morning outside I stood And saw a little red winged bird Shining like a burning bush Singing like a scripture verse It made me want to bow my head I remember when the church let out How things have changed since then Everything is holy now It used to be a world half there Heaven's second rate hand me down I'm walking with a reverent air Cause everything is holy now Everything, everything, everything is holy now Although I've been minister of this congregation for almost 20 years, I'm still learning new things. For instance, recently, Ted Jones uh, taught me that uh, the zip code for our church, 37919, if you turn it upside down, spells Bible. And maybe that shouldn't surprise us since we're on Church Row or the Miracle Mile or what Ruth Martin called Kingdom Pike. This week, on our street, there's been a display of unity as different congregations all down the street have set up the same sign that says, Love Your Neighbor. It's a message found in both the Jewish and Christian Bible, but also is taught in many of the great world religions. For instance, in one of our religious education classrooms, the kids have put up a poster that says, Buddha was not a Buddhist. Jesus was not a Christian. Muhammad was not a Muslim. They were teachers who taught love. Love was their religion. So religious scholars might think that's a bit oversimplistic, but it is tapping into a truth found in all the mystical traditions that there is a religion that underlies all religions. The religion of love, the religion of compassion, the religion of empathy, something that is written into our hearts and placed into our minds and are part of who we are and that we can be in community together to strengthen this part of who we are. So these signs that say, love your neighbor, can be a reminder to live up to our best selves. But here's the problem. We don't always live up to our best selves. As the, as the Apostle James remarked, all too often we claim to love God who we cannot see while showing no love to our neighbor who we can see. We become so preoccupied with the invisible and the metaphysical that we miss the opportunities for ministry right in front of us, right before us. Religion is meant to attract people, but all too often religion repels people. All too often, religion offends people. When the Catholic monk and peace activist and social justice warrior Thomas Merton, uh, he worked for peace, he worked for justice, he worked for environmental responsibility. But when he spoke to church audiences, he would often say, do not be quick to condemn other people who do not believe in God, for perhaps it is your coldness your avarice, your mediocrity, your materialism, and your selfishness that have chilled their faith. In other words, if we want to know what's wrong with religion, we shouldn't place the blame elsewhere, but look inward. Look at ourselves in the mirror. Examine our own lives to see if we may be a part of the problem. This morning I want to talk about how religion can self-sabotage. I want to reflect on how we, as people of faith, can be our own worst enemies. I want to speak about religion in general, but then I want to move on to Unitarian Universalism in particular. There is a proverb that says, those who live in glass houses should not throw stones. 
Well, obviously, the person who wrote that proverb never went to one of our denominational meetings. The Reverend John Burens, who was a former minister of this church and a former president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, once said to the national gathering of our faith, the General Assembly, he said, I'm no longer surprised that we shoot ourselves in the foot. I am surprised how quickly we reload. Rabbi Abraham Heichel once wrote, it is customary to blame secular science and anti-religious philosophy for the eclipse of religion in modern society. It would be more honest to blame religion for its own defeats. Religion has declined not because it was refuted, but because it has become irrelevant, dull, oppressive, insipid. When faith is completely replaced by creed, worship by discipline, love by habit, when the crisis of today is ignored for the splendors of the past, when faith becomes an heirloom rather than a living fountain, when religion speaks only in the name of authority rather than with the voice of compassion, its message becomes meaningless. So let's take a moment to reflect on how we can be our worst enemies in religion in a big picture way, it might include people of all faiths, before looking at Unitarian Universalism in particular. I believe we can be our own worst enemies when we divide people into us versus them, good versus evil, right versus wrong, with no room for respectful dialogue or disagreement. My friend, the Reverend John Butler, the former president of the NAACP, likes to say, God gave me two ears and one mouth. But all too often in religion, we act like we've got one mouth while we cover our ears, where we refuse to listen and learn, and we, refu we, we act like we don't need to be in community with anyone who is very different from ourselves. That's when we get it wrong. We are our own worst enemies when we deny reality, when we use our devotion to something sacred as an excuse to ignore the results of science. We're in a time of a global pandemic and we are facing the existential threat of climate change. So religion needs science now more than ever. In the Baha'i tradition, they say that uh, uh, science and religion are like two wings of one bird. We need both wings in order to fly. We need both wings in order to move forward. We are our own worst enemies when we cast blame, when we find fault in others but can't see it in ourselves, when we condemn others while exonerating ourselves, when we can see the speck of sawdust in someone else's eye while we ignore the log in our own. Sometimes when we cast blame, it has a supernatural, supernatural connotation as when we say, the devil made me do it. And sometimes it's the Almighty. There's a story that's told about a man who is angry with God. He says, God, I am so angry. Why won't you do anything about war? And why won't you do anything about poverty? And why won't you do anything about illness and disease and all the suffering in the world? I am so angry, God. Why won't you do something? And God replies, I am doing something. I am making you angry. Religion at its healthiest is when we stop blaming others when we have an opportunity to take responsibility ourselves. As Confucius, the ancient Chinese philosopher said, I do not blame heaven, nor do I blame others, but I start with what is below and work to what is above. Or we might say, if we love our neighbors who we can see, we might tap into powers that are unseen. In the Sufi Muslim tradition, there is a saying that sometimes the thickest veil that separates us from God is the worship of the worshiper and the wisdom of the wise and the devotion of the devout. In other words, religion is the veil that separates us from all that is divine. All too often we are our own worst enemy 
because we think we're doing the right thing and we don't even notice the harm we're doing. As the French philosopher Blaise Pascal once observed, people never do evil so cheerfully than when they do it out of religious conviction. Sometimes the worst forms of evil are introduced by people who are attempting to do good. So having talked about some of the ways that religion can be its own worst enemy in general, let's talk about the Unitarian Universalist tradition in particular. I got on our church Facebook page, the TVUC Members and Friends group, and I posted this question. How are we our own worst enemies as Unitarian Universalists? And I got over 115 comments, lots of comments, which I've condensed into this much uh, smaller uh, statement, combining different comments with other people. So here is some of the wisdom from our own tradition. We are our own worst enemies when we are self-congratulatory, when we over-intellectualize everything, when we believe we can't be racist because we're Unitarian Universalists, when we are cliquish and do not welcome the stranger, when we forget that lifespan programming needs to include young adults, when we preach tolerance but practice intolerance, when we teach respect but practice disrespect, when we adhere to the rules rather than listening to our own hearts, when we beat ourselves up because we can't save the planet or do the same amount of work every day, beat ourselves up because we can't right every wrong or overcome every injustice. We are our own worst enemy when we have a harder time accepting our own flaws than flaws in other people. We are our own worst enemies when we feel we can't be honest about our personal struggles with employment or unemployment or mental health or a chronic illness. We are our own worst enemies when we consciously or unconsciously uh, convey unhealthy ideas about human sexuality, gender identity, or sexual orientation. We are our own worst enemies when we believe that getting our words right is more important than getting our actions right. When we think social action is just about belonging to a political party and voting in a particular election, when our congregational meetings become, and this is a quote, someone said, when our congregational meetings become a bunch of real smart, real ornery people in a mass headbutting. That's a colorful description. We are our own worst enemies when we compare our church at its best to other churches at their worst. We are our own worst enemies when we dis when we think of ourselves as introverts, but come off to other people as snobs. We are our own worst enemies when our worship services feel like reading from a menu instead of enjoying a feast. When we say we are a church, but we act like a country club. When we ignore or remain silent about the vexing problems of economic class in this church and in American society. We are our own worst enemies when we prefer comfort to challenge, when our conversations about race ignore white privilege and seem to be fraught with white fragility. We are our own worst enemies when we profess to be egalitarian but practice elitism, when we are complacent. We are our own worst enemies when we feel like we have all the answers and that our logic is infallible. We are our own worst enemies when we love our free church but forget to fund it. That's, that was something for the stewardship team. When We are our own worst enemies when we prescribe cheap grace, when we prescribe forgiveness without telling people how to heal and how to hold people accountable. We are our own worst enemies when we create drama and drag other people in it. I posted, we are our own worst enemies when we get into arguments on the internet, which we did a little bit in this discussion, but not too much. And I might also add, we are our own worst enemies when we give our minister too much to preach about. Each one of those things could be a sermon. 
Another theme that uh, we could develop could be summed up in something I often say. I sometimes say there's a paradox at work in our faith. We believe we can learn from all the world's religions except for the one we grew up in. We believe we can learn from all the world religions except the one we grew up in. And this is because we often study the best translations of the best scriptures of other traditions, but the religion we grew up in is the one we knew that human beings taught us. And so the challenge of spiritual growth is to, is to be able to see the good in our own upbringing and not just the bad, and be able to see the bad in other traditions and not just the good. One of the things I've learned from being a Unitarian Universalist for many decades is that uh, the more I feel at home here, the more I am at peace that other people feel at home elsewhere. Making peace with our past can be an important part of learning to love our neighbors. This idea that religion can be its own worst enemy is not a new idea. Today we hear a lot of criticisms of call-out culture, and yet it was probably the Hebrew prophets who invented call-out culture, calling out religion for all its misdeeds and wrongdoing. As we enter into the season of Lent, which is traditionally a time of fasting, it might do well for us to reflect on what Isaiah had to say about fasting and other acts of personal piety that seem to be ignoring issues of a bigger scale, issues of social justice. And since our church has a zip code that upside down spells Bible, I thought it appropriate to have a reading from the Bible, the book of Isaiah, who calls out religion by saying, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wandering stranger with shelter? When you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood, then your light will break forth like a dawn and your healing will begin. So personal piety or personal spiritual discipline is good. And I know people of many different faiths who have benefited from the practice of fasting. However, it is when we love our neighbor that our personal spiritual practice becomes manifest. When we love our neighbor, it's like we are a window through which divine light shines. If we love God alone, no one can see it. That work is invisible. But when we love our neighbor, that spirituality is made visible. Earlier this week, I was driving down Kingston Pike and I was, it was really neat to see all the congregations with this banner out front. Of course, not every congregation decided to put up a banner, but I'm not gonna call anybody out. I'm not gonna name any names because I think we can agree that we don't always have to have an outward and invisible sign, an outward and visible sign in order to be manifest within us an inward and spiritual grace that empowers us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Something within us that wells up like a wellspring of the joy of living that empowers us to love one another. This week I was in I got interested in numerology because of our zip code and I went into our office closet where there was a container of paper clips and I looked at it and I quickly estimated that there were 307 paper clips in there. So I did a little internet research and discovered that the number 307 uh, is uh, the, uh, in mystical traditions known as the number for wholeness and completeness. And here's the thing, if you write out the number 307 and include a caret symbol for all the unknown variables of life and then turn it upside down, it says love. Now maybe this kind of numerology is not the best kind of theology. Maybe I need to uh, do something other than numerology in my sermons, but 
Let's end with some good theology. Love is the spirit of this church. So let's go forth into the world and transform this world through acts of love and justice. May you be filled with the blessings of this covenanted community. May you carry them with you as you depart from here. And may you discover the places in the world where these blessings are needed. And may you have the courage to share them. And also, may there be an open place within you to receive the blessings of the people whom you will meet along the way. Blessed be. Even though we're socially distanced, we're still connected. I invite you to come to our virtual coffee hour or participate in one of our online events this week, which you can find by signing up for our newsletter. You can come to the church this afternoon and get your free yard sign to remind us of how we are all connected during this global pandemic. Go in peace and have a wonderful week. When I was a boy each week On Sunday we would go to church And pay attention to the priest He would read the holy word And consecrate the holy bread And everyone would kneel and bow Today the only difference is Everything's holy now Everything, everything, everything is whole.